Hello everybody and welcome to a new video. Before we continue, let's first hear the sights and sound of this beautiful 386 booting. Let's hear that again. There's just something immensely satisfying by hearing a PC booting like this. The clicky keyboard and the hard drive doing its thing is something you just don't get on a virtual machine. Now let's get the show on the road. This is a follow-up video of my previous Slackware video. It is still the same 386 4 megabyte machine as I still haven't found a 4 megabyte SIM modules to put in this. But I do have an alternative plan for a future video as I will be switching to this 486 with some additional memory to actually run some Linux applications. But that's going to be for a future video because I still have a lot of stuff to cover like removing this Windows 95. But now, back to the 386 computer and the content of this video. And that includes doing an NFS install, find out why my CD-ROM drive doesn't want to play nice with my network interface card, building a kernel, see if the CD-ROM drive works, and play some tunes. So, to get started, we need to turn on the computer and insert our netboot disk, which will be used to boot into the Slackware installer. So this is not the bare boot image that we used in the previous video, but this is the netboot image, which does have support for the networking card, which is in this computer. So when we hit enter here, it will load up the kernel, which is on this floppy disk, and that kernel does support the networking card. So as you can see here, this kernel has loaded the 3C509 driver and it's found the networking card at IO port 210 and IRQ11. So that means that we will be able to pull off all of the disk sets from the network. So instead of swapping in floppies all of the time during the installation, they will just be pulled off the network and that should make the installation a lot easier. Now to continue the installation, we need to insert the same color 144 root disk now. And that should be the final disk that we need to insert in this computer throughout the entire Slackware installation. So now it will load up this root disk and mount the root file system and we can continue with the setup. Now, uh, let's log in as root and start the setup. But first let's take a look at the partitions on the hard drive. So they're still the same as last time. So I'm not going to be changing those. I am going to be uh, making the swap space available again for the setup program as four megabytes of RAM isn't sufficient to run the Slackware setup. So you need to activate this swap space. So we're going to do that here. And then we can execute the setup command, which will launch this setup program from Slackware allowing us to uh, prepare for the installation. Now the first thing we're going to do is we're going to select our source media and we're not going to be selecting floppy disks but we're going to be installing via NFS. Now notice the ominous warning here that installing via NFS can be a real time saver if you are good with TCP IP but it can be tricky if you are a beginner. Now luckily I am a Linux expert so you're in good hands. I hope. So let's kick things off. First thing it does, it asks us for an IP address. So again, no DHCP support. We need to provide an IP address that will be assigned to our networking card. We need to assign a net mask, which is pretty standard stuff, a broadcast address, a network address. It asks us if we have a gateway. We'll go ahead and add that. Next up is the IP address of our NFS server and the NFS server is the machine that will host our disk sets. And in my case, it's this Synology NAS that I have hooked up to my network. 
Now this is to replace all of the floppy disks that I used in the previous video. So it's a lot more convenient to load off your disks off of the network. And because this 3COM3C509B should be well supported in Linux, an NFS installation seems to be a very good fit. Not really sure if it will save us a lot of time, but it will save us a lot of hassle as opposed to working with floppy disks. But now back to our Synology NAS that will act as an NFS server. Now because we are going to be doing an NFS install, we also need to have an NFS server and the Synology software which is installed on this NAS will allow us to do just that. So if we load up the software, go to control panel here, load up the services, we can see that besides SMB and AFP, we also have NFS as a file sharing option. So I've enabled the NFS file service and that allows me to uh, edit all of my shared folders that I have here. So I've created an NFS share and if I click on edit, I can give it a name. And there are also NFS permissions now that I can set. So if I go to NFS permissions, I can create different clients for this share. And these clients represent basically computers on the network identified by an IP address that are allowed to access that NFS. Notice how we also have a mount path, which is slash volume one slash NFS share, something that we will need when mounting an NFS share and also something we'll need during this NFS installation. So if I bring up an existing Linux box here, which has an IP address of 177, it can access the NFS server. So here I'm just gonna show you how Linux uh, interacts with such an NFS server. So as you can see, the 177 is a known client here. And now I can just execute the mount command like I would do with a hard drive or a CD-ROM, but I just specify the NFS as the file system. I specify the IP address of the NFS server, which is the IP address of the Synology. And then I specify the path, which is slash volume one slash NFS share. And then I just hook up the mount point. Now this command exits without any output. So that means that the command has run successfully. And now I can navigate to the mount NFS share. And I will see all of the files on that shared folder here now on my Linux client. And on that share, I have included all of the disk sets that I need to do a fresh Slackware install on my 386 machine. So back to the actual Slackware installation. We have an internal ethernet card and we need to provide the Slackware source directory here. So this is the um, path on the NFS server that we want to use that does contain the disk sets. So this is somewhat the Synology naming convention because volume one is the disk set that we used on the Synology NAS and NFS share is just the name that I have given to the NFS share. So these two need to correspond. So we can hit continue now and it will switch to text mode because here the Slackware setup program will now be mounting the NFS. And as you can see, the mount has been done successfully as there are no errors. So we do not need to try this again and we can continue with the installation. Next up is the target selection that we need to do. So we're selecting our uh, Linux native partition on the hard drive, hit OK. Select the file system that we wanna format the drive with, do the actual format. And once that has been done, we can continue with selecting the disk sets that we want to install. So I'm gonna be selecting the base Linux system, program development, so that we can compile kernels, networking, so that we have a TCP IP stack and the utilities, and also the X window system. So that's good enough for now. And these are also the disk sets that I have on my Synology NAS. So we can hit OK. We will use the default tag files. So prompt mode is selected and we can continue with the install. And it will begin by installing the disk series A. And notice that it doesn't prompt me to insert a floppy disk because it will just pull it off of the NFS server, which is really convenient. Now I'm gonna be speeding up this footage here because I don't wanna bore you with a full length real time install. 
And you do need to take into account that the overall time it takes to do an NFS install is pretty much comparable with a floppy disk install. But you get the added bonus that you don't have to deal with bad floppies, that you don't need to create the floppies, and that you don't need to swap them in and out. So it's definitely a big improvement in terms of uh, installation. So here it's moving on to the X disk series and it will install all of the X related packages. Now when the installation has finished, Slackware will uh, prompt you to configure the system like creating a boot disk, uh, setting up the mouse, the modem, the time zone, pretty much the same thing as we saw in the previous video. We do need to configure the network again, despite the fact that we have already done so for the NFS setup. So we'll just go ahead and do the same thing. It will ask us some additional things like host name, domain name and name server. But overall, it's pretty much the same information that you need to input as you did when doing the NFS setup. So all we need to do now is finish the setup, select a time zone here and reboot the system and our new Slackware installation will be up and running. Now, while I was creating the first video last week, I noticed that I couldn't get my CD-ROM drive to play nice with my networking card. CD-ROM drive would always work, but as soon as the Mitsumi CD-ROM card was inserted in the PC, the networking card would fail. Now, I did my IRQ bookkeeping and I had the CD-ROM interface card set to IRQ 10 using these jumpers here. And the IO address was set to 300 using the switch block. And my networking card, I had configured to use IRQ 11, a different IO port. So I didn't assume that there would be any conflicts between the two. The 3COM program also had an internal test program, which did a whole bunch of tests, including an interrupt test, and everything uh, ran fine without any issues. So I think on that level, everything was fine. But in the Linux environment, as soon as the Mitsumi card was inserted, the networking card didn't run. Now, one thing I did notice during startup is that it found the CD-ROM drive, the Mitsumi CD-ROM drive at IRQ11, which was bizarre because the interface card clearly stated that it was set to IRQ10. The networking card, on the other hand, was detected correctly. IO address 210 and IRQ11, so no issues there. I then tried to pass some command line arguments to the kernel because I know that Mitsumi driver does support uh, setting the IO port and the IRQ. So I explicitly set the IRQ to 10. And as it was loading Linux, I noticed that it did detect the Mitsumi driver on IRQ 10 now, as I think it should. But I still had issues with the network. As you can see during startup, I got these network is unreachable errors. So that something was definitely still wrong. So if we can't fix it on the Mitsumi driver, let's see if we can change the IRQ on the networking card. So I'm just gonna be booting from an MS-DOS boot floppy and then using my 3COM3C509B driver disk, which contains this configuration utility, allowing us to configure the networking card and test to see if it's working properly. And sure enough, after changing the interrupt from 11 to 10, and saving that configuration to the network interface card, the network was up and running. Onto the CD-ROM drive, and this is the iconic single speed Mitsumi CD-ROM drive, which has excellent support in Linux. It's a non-IDE CD-ROM drive because this dates before the ATAPI standard. And we're going to be doing some blasphemy here because we are going to try and read this Windows 95 CD-ROM in Linux. Now this CD-ROM drive has issues in reading the more modern CD-R formats, but it is capable of uh, reading original CD-ROM uh, disks. So that's what we're gonna be doing here. So let's switch over to the keyboard and let's try and mount the CD-ROM device, which is on def CD-ROM. I have created a mount point in mount CD-ROM and we need to specify the file system, which is ISO 9660. And as you can see, it is able to read the disk perfectly. I'm sorry, it's in Dutch, but here you can see the readme file of Microsoft Windows 95. 
Next up, it's time to build ourselves a new kernel. So I have already installed the Linux source tree. It's on one of the disk sets. I think it's in program development. And uh, you get this readme on how to compile the kernel. So here it basically describes that you need to execute a couple of make commands and make config is the first command that we will execute, which will allow us to, you know, configure the, the features that we want our kernel to support. Um, so we need math emulation because we have an SX CPU. We want normal hard drive support. Don't need XT hard drive support. We need TCP IP. We don't need SCSI support. We will be including uh, network device support. So the only network driver that we need is the 3COM3C509. So all the rest we can skip. There are some CD-ROM drivers, so we'll add the Mitsumi one. Some file system support. We can leave this all default except for the ISO 9660, which is not enabled by default so we will add support for that we'll add some parallel printer support we uh, add some mouse support here sound card support we will be needing that we don't need the kernel profiling and then it will switch again to the sound options so we don't want the full version of the sound driver. We don't want to disable it, but we only want to have the sound blaster support. So all the rest we can skip. We will be adding sound blaster pro support. And then we need to specify some IRQs, DMAs, buffer sizes, and that's basically it. So now we have uh, configured our kernel. So all we need to do now is do a make dependency and then a make z image and then we should have a kernel image that we can install. Now compiling a kernel on a 386 is not something that you want to be doing every day. So just to give you an idea, the first thing you need to do is to do a make dep, which will prepare all the dependencies for building the kernel. Now on my laptop, for example, in a virtual machine, this takes about two seconds or three seconds. On this machine, this takes 20 minutes. And this is something that is only a small portion of the time needed to build a full kernel. So that means that building a kernel on this machine, and believe me, I have done it, takes approximately two hours, which is still reasonable for this time period. I mean, later versions of the kernel have bigger source trees, have more functionality, so they take longer to build. It's possible that um, you would spend the entire night building a kernel. So two hours is still considered acceptable, uh, I think, in 1993, 1994. But after a two hour wait, the kernel image has finished building. So all that's left to do now is to copy it to our uh, location where the Linux loader expects it. I will create a backup of my uh, current kernel so that I can always revert back to it. And then I will copy over the uh, Z image file, which is created by our kernel build onto the VM Linus, run Lilo and do a reboot. And during the reboot, you should see in the kernel output that it has detected our Sound Blaster Pro card. So let's just wait for that. And here you can see it has found two sound devices, Sound 2 and Sound 1. One is the Sound Blaster Pro and the other is the Yamaha OPL3 chip. The I.O. ports seem to be OK, IRQ seem to be OK, so we can uh, test that as soon as the system has booted. Now, the first thing we need to test the sound card is an actual application that can produce sound. So I have found this tracker application on an old CD-ROM and I will be installing it now. 
Now, this uh, tracker application only has the source file, so we still need to compile the program, and this takes a very long time on this 386 base machine. The small program, which is basically just a command line tool, takes about four minutes to compile. But after the compilation has done, we will get a tracker executable and we can provide a mod file, which was a very popular sound format in the 90s, and see if it produces sound. But as you can hear, it doesn't. Instead, we get this error opening audio device. Now in the Linux source tree uh, folder structure there is a readme file specifically for the sound drivers which are uh, part of the kernel and it contains some useful information like how to pass command line arguments to Lilo, how to configure stuff like DMA, IRQ uh, at runtime so after the kernel has been compiled, some important notes and one of the things which is also in the readme file is how to debug issues so there is this dev sound stat file that you can uh, query to see what kind of sound devices it has found but there is also a snippet of script at the end of this documentation file of this readme that uh, allows for the creation of sound devices something which isn't done by default so this is something that we will need to execute right now so let's put this in a shell script make it executable and run it so that it can create all of the sound devices in the dev folder on this machine. And now that this script has executed, let's just take a quick look at the dev sound stat file. So it has found our Sound Blaster Pro. So let's try this for a second time. We execute tracker, we specify our mod file, and hopefully we should hear something now. We just need to be a little bit patient. So I do think that the sound card is operational now. So I hope you've enjoyed this little video here. We've covered a lot of ground. We did the NFS install. We looked at the CD-ROM drive and networking issues. We compiled a new kernel. Added some sound support. And for a future Linux retro video, I will be using a slightly beefier machine unless I can find some additional memory for this 386, which I haven't been able to do so. But either way, I hope to see you guys in a future video. So please consider liking, subscribing and commenting to the videos. I really appreciate all the support and I hope to see you guys soon. Bye bye.